my name is Sergio Peña Fiel. I am from Chile. And today's talk is the first one of the series, and it's about model evaluation in general, and but focusing on interpretability, which is the, the topic of the series itself. So a little uh, information about me. Uh, I'm Yama Master in Computer Science from the University of Chile. Uh, my master thesis was the classification model that we will be reviewing in this series. I am also the uh, tech leader of the data science unit in the Arturo Lopez Perez Foundation, which is this cancer institute that we are we're talking. And I also have a startup <laughs> because we have some entrepreneur spirit. <laughs> And the startup is about uh, healthcare also. Okay, it brings technology to health institutions and interoperability and things like that. So one of my main interests is to apply these methods in healthcare. This is um, what I do mainly. So for today, we have uh, this uh, agenda. We will be talking about performance evaluation first, which is uh, more or less what we know about uh, comparing models and uh, evaluate them. And then we will be reviewing the different strategies for interpretability evaluation. Yes, uh, among the, this, we will be uh, looking at different types of interpretability, uh, some agreement metrics, uh, and sensitivity analysis, which is um, automatic uh, method to evaluate interpretability. But we also be reviewing expert evaluation, which requires uh, people, users, experts, on the model to, to know if the results are good or not. And um, we will see an example of all of this uh, applied in a real use case uh, at the end of the presentation. So the motivation for all of this is that in machine learning field, we have many different models. As you may know, we have uh, artificial neural networks, right? We have random forest, support vector machines, many, many models uh, that solves um, some task. Uh, for example, in supervised learning, they solve classification and regression task. Uh, so we need uh, a way to know which model is better, right? Uh, uh, framework or a methodology to compare this is better than this one and have an answer for that. Um, the, this um, uh, can be evaluated in different uh, aspects, not only uh, performance. So we have some of the most common uh, dimensions or aspects that we are interested in evaluating this model. First, we have performance, that is, uh, how accurate and correct are the results of the model comparing to the real uh, outcomes. Uh, this is by far the most common aspect to evaluate uh, models. I think 80% of articles in machine learning only report performance evaluation and forget about the others. But we have other ones like interpretability, which is the ability to uh, explain the results of the model. So you have a machine that not only sets the this will be for this class, it also gives an explanation about this uh, this output. So this is interpretability, and as Nelson said before, uh, we have some use cases where interpretability is required, like when there are laws or compliance to to meet uh, with these models. Or, or when we you have critical uh, process that can be uh, give uh, to a black box machine without knowing which is happening. Yeah, but we also have other dimensions, not only interpretability and performance. For example, we have complexity, which is like the uh, number of resources, time, memory, or anything, space in general, that a model takes to make a um, uh, prediction. Yes. For some other use cases, for example, if you are deploying your model to a very uh, limited machine, like in Internet of Things um, scenarios, you have to address this uh, issue of complexity. So you will prefer less complex model than other ones. Uh, other uh, aspects are like scalability, 
for example, there are models that need uh, a lot of data and the data have to be synced to make prediction. Other models, you can cluster them in different machines and there is no problem. And the last one is consistency, which is uh, that the um, outputs of the model are uh, similar to similar inputs, right? And this is important when we are uh, retraining models over time, for example. And you, when you deploy a new model with new data, you expect to be similar to the previous one. So you, in these scenarios, you need consistency uh, more than the others. So we will talk about the first two ones. Uh, performance is uh, like the most straightforward way to uh, evaluate models. Uh, since we are talking about supervised learning, we know uh, in the data that we have uh, that a certain record has a certain class, a certain label or value, to, which is the real value that we collect from the, uh, from the uh, process that we are uh, using, right? So we typically, what we uh, do is to separate the data set into two groups. Uh, one is used for training the model, right? And the other one is used for testing, for evaluating this model. And the idea is to separate the data at the beginning, so the model never sees uh, the other uh, set. Uh, and, and we can compute several uh, metrics, indicators about that. Oh, this slide, I think it's incomplete, but uh, it's no problem. So for example, for classification, only to, to, to name a few, we have uh, the accuracy, which is the proportion of the uh, records in the test uh, set that were uh, correctly predicted. We have the F1 score that is like a, a harmonious mean between the precision and the recall. So it's a better um, indicator when we have unbalanced data sets. And for regression, we have, for example, mean square error, which is the, the, the average distance between the, the real values and the actual values and the predicted values. And um, we have other things like R square score, which is a metric of how it is called also coefficient of determinant. And it's a statistical uh, indicator that says we, how much of the variance of the prediction is explained by the prediction and not by random. So we have, and, and for that we have many other uh, uh, metrics. All of uh, these metrics has a formula. So you can put the data, uh, compute the formula, and you have a result. So uh, for performance, it's very easy to say, because you can measure that uh, and compare them in the same uh, scenarios. You can also maybe have seen this visualization, like confusion matrix, uh, receive operator curves, and, uh, and actual versus predicted plots. Right, this is very common. But uh, if we go to interpretability, which is the main uh, thing that we will be reviewing here, uh, there is no um, simple way to evaluate interpretability. Unlike performance, we don't have formulas. We don't have uh, anything um, simple to do that. So uh, first, we should um, see the definition of the interpretability to know what uh, is this. So here we have two definitions of uh, two authors from the last years. And the first says that interpretability is the degree to which a human can understand the cause of a decision. Yeah. And the second one says that interpretability is the degree uh, to which a human can consistently predict the model's result. So what these two have in common uh, is that there is a human in the definition. So uh, in performance, you only have a formula. You put this and give an output. Here we have a human that need to understand some part of the process of the model. So this is what makes interpretability harder to, to, to evaluate. Um, well, the, this is the, 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 the conclusion, that there is no rigorous way to, to do that. 
and we are dealing also with uh, the human uh, opinion, for example. So maybe some expert will agree with some results, but other not, and you have all of this uh, kind of problem. But we will uh, be reviewing some strategies to, to do interpretability evaluation. Uh, but first, we need to know uh, the degrees of interpretability that we have in models. Uh, typically, we have five groups, which are these ones, uh, from the most interpretable to the least one. Uh, first, we have the model transparency, which is like the model are uh, simple and the user can understand uh, what the model does and, and they can make the prediction alongside with the model. So this is the case, for example, of decision trees, uh, linear regression, where we can see the tree and go uh, descend in the branches and see the result. And this is the most interpretable model because they are like white boxes. You can see uh, what is happening. Then we, do we have the global interpretability that is the, uh, the one that the model provides an explanation that works for all of the data, yeah, for all instances. So um, you have like a, a, a certain result that if you apply this result every time, you always uh, see that it, um, it matches the, the definition. So in this case, uh, the model can do a certain uh, complex things, but it outputs this uh, like global statement for interpretability. This is the case, for example, of uh, this one, uh, Dempster Sheffer Gradient Descent, which is the model that I created, and we will be reviewing this presentation, and also other ones like Night Base and, and some other models. Then we have the third group, that is group interpretability, which is uh, that the model can find patterns that apply to certain uh, groups of the instances of the uh, data set. In this case, this is the most common, I think, uh, kind of interpretability, but it is not so strong than the uh, global interpretability. Uh, here we have, for example, uh, K nearest neighbors, where you can see where my neighbors and we can explain somehow the, the prediction. The same with Bayesian networks, we can know which uh, attributes uh, depends on the others and we can uh, have some kind of interpretability there also. And random forest with feature importance, we also have uh, uh, some kind of interpretability. Uh, the follow the next group is the local interpretability, which the model can explain one instance at a time. Yeah, this is the the weakest interpretability of all of them. Um, this can be achieved by, for example, uh, sensitivity analysis and other methods that we will be reviewing later in the presentation. And finally, we have the models that have no interpretability at all, and that as uh, that is mainly the case of deep learning and another uh, kind of model that make a lot of nonlinear uh, computations, something like that. So if we need to uh, group this, uh, the first two are uh, the best. Uh, the, um, the, the first two uh, groups are what we call the, they are interpretable models. Yeah, the, the next group is, uh, which is only the group interpretability, is like a slightly interpretability model. So we can know some insights, but not uh, specifically what is happening. And the last one is um, mainly considered as not interpretable, interpretable models. So this is the classification. And we have a, a trade-off. This uh, between accuracy and interpretability. So if we put these three groups in one axis and the accuracy in the other, and we ask these models to, to solve the same task, uh, we typically see this um, kind of chart where the most 
uh, accurate models are the ones that are not interpretable, and the uh, least accurate models are the ones that are highly interpretable. So we have this trade-off, where if you uh, go for interpretability, you lose performance and the other way uh, around. So um, this is something that happens in, uh, in real uh, scenarios. So we will be reviewing uh, a little bit about decision trees because the decision trees are, as we said before, the top of the interpretable models. And as you may know, decision trees are these classification models where we have a tree and the inner nodes are attributes of your data set that have a condition. And uh, for the two branches, uh, we descend if the condition is true or false. And then we have other uh, inner nodes, and when we reach a, um, an outer node, a leaf, uh, so we have the, the, the class predicted for this input. Uh, what is interesting about decision trees is the building process of these trees, uh, because they follow uh, a certain methodology, which is the a maximization is information gain, yeah? So um, when you are trying to build uh, a decision tree for a data set specifically, you need to know which node I put in the root, right? Or in the, in the first node. So uh, what we, uh, the algorithm, uh, what it does is to search all the possible splits of the data. Uh, so for all the attributes, it's very expensive. And it uh, computes a formula, which is called the Gini impurity, which tells you how pure or impure are uh, the two partitions that generate this split. And you try to uh, minimize this uh, impurity. So you have the uh, most different uh, partitions in the uh, in the split, and then if you iterate over all the possible uh, attributes, you do the you find the the best one, yeah. And you take this; it's a greedy algorithm. You take always the best solution uh, possible, and then you repeat the process recursively in the uh, for all the other uh, uh, partitions, right? Uh, what is interesting about this process is that the Decision trees, if you follow this uh, methodology, is guaranteed to be the best possible um, decision tree for the data set that you provide, right? There are no other uh, better decision tree. For example, exchanging some node will give you a worse performance than this. So uh, if decision trees are uh, the, the, have this property, we can see that they are like a baseline for our interpretable models. And this is the first uh, thing that we can do for evaluate interpretability. So if we assume that decision trees are the best uh, interpretable model, and we know that the decision tree procedure always generate the best decision tree, uh, we can um, compare our model to a decision tree. How similar or how different is my model to a decision tree, right? And this is the first interpretable uh, metric that we will be reviewing, yeah? And, uh, and how to compare with uh, if they are similar or not. We have like what we call agreement metric. So we compare some aspects of the model to the decision tree and, and they give you like uh, formulas that we can use for for computing this interpretability. So here are three of these agreement metrics. Uh, the first one is feature rank correlation. So in the decision tree, we can know that the attributes that are in the root or in the first uh, layers of the tree are more important than the ones that are in the bottom of the tree, right? So we can rank the features uh, using this, uh, like the with the distance from the root, and uh, also many of the models have a way to rank uh, the feature also, like feature 
um, like feature selection models, for example. So we can compare these two ranks yeah, using a statistic. Uh, we have a, a metric called rank correlation. If, we, if you have two ranks of the same uh, sets, you can uh, check how similar they are. So this is the first uh, agreement metric and interpretability metric. The other one is rule equivalence. This is, is uh, applies for rule-based models. Uh, if you have models that can produce rules, yeah, like random forest, for example, or grain boosting or things like that, you can uh, also um, have a, an order for these rules. So in the same way, the, the ones that are in the top are more important in the decision tree. And if your model gives this, you can uh, check if the rules uh, are equivalent in these two models, and you can count or something like that how many of these rules match between these two models. So you have another um, metric. This is a more, this is simpler in general to, to compute because you only have to match one thing with another. And the last one is subset differentiation. And this is a, an important thing that uh, can be applied to any model. So you, uh, you have your interpretable model and you want to compare with the decision tree. So you ask the model to produce the interpretable result for the whole data and gives you an answer, right? And then you descend one step in the tree. So you have two different uh, sub uh, data sets, right? And you ask the model to uh, make the interpretable result for these two uh, subsets. And the idea is that as the split is so strong, the interpretability for these two subsets uh, should be very different uh, to the interpretability of the whole set. Yeah, and you can measure this. And uh, if this uh, is true for your model, so you have a model that behaves like a decision tree because it's changing in the same way. Um, so here we have three metrics that are not so simple like before, as you can see, but uh, they can provide you insights about the interpretability. Uh, going to another topic, we have uh, something that we call feature importance that we uh, checked uh, in the last slide also, that uh, is a common technique that many models have, uh, especially from the uh, second group, from the uh, slightly interpretable models that can rank these uh, features and give you a measure of how important this feature is. Yeah? This uh, is helpful for feature selection, like for saying these attributes are not important, I can drop them from the data set and have a better, simpler model. Um, but uh, the drawback of this is that it doesn't uh, give you the actual um, result that happens when you variate one of these uh, attributes. For example, if we change this first attribute, which is the most important, and we increase the value, what happens? We can not tell from this chart why, which is the, the result of this uh, change. So this is what uh, the limitation of this, this model have. Um, okay, so this is uh, the same. Uh, and then we have a, another a kind of interpretability, which is for the group of the least interpretable uh, models, which is sensitivity analysis, right? Sensitivity analysis is a technique that uh, doesn't require uh, that the model has have to be interpretable because you change the input of the model. So you make a small changes to the values of an input of the model, and you see if the output of the model changes with this change. And you can so know the, the interaction or the dependency that they have. So uh, there are two uh, main sensitivity analysis that are uh, very popular. The one is partial dependency plot, and the other is local prediction boundaries will be we will see both of them. The first partial dependency plot are uh, these charts that uh, explains how a certain attribute, uh, one of the, the data set, 
change, uh, change your output. So uh, you start with the all the whole testing set, for example, that you have, and you uh, force the value of the attribute to have a certain value that you you know, for example, zero, and you compute the prediction for all of the records, and you uh, plot in this uh, in this chart, and you do the same for uh, 10, 20, and and the full range, right? And you can so uh, connect the line. So this one line is one record in your testing set that you have changed one attribute, and then you can see if this uh, changes in the attributes, uh, change the, their the output, right? If these lines tend to go up, uh, then you know that when the temperature, for example, is higher, the, uh, the dependency is that the, the target value is higher, also, right? And you can uh, measure uh, or plot the average of these all the, the old lines, and you know, a uh, better uh, understanding of the uh, of the chart, right? So this is a partial dependence plot. Uh, you can also uh, can produce partial dependence plot for two variables. So you can have one variable in this uh, axis and the other another one, and you plot with a heat map or a contour chart uh, the the changes in the in the output. Right, and you can see the dependency of these attributes to the to the output. So this is a sensitivity analysis, partial dependence plot, and gives you a interpretability one by one in the characteristics. It's better than feature importance, as you can see, and it's um, not so hard to produce. So uh, they are a good alternative for having interpretability. The next one is a log. Uh, the local interpretability um, that tries to find the boundary uh, between the classes or the or the values, right? So what we do here, uh, there is a, a method called LIME, local interpretable model agnostic explanations, that uh, for a record, yeah, this is local interpretability. So you have one instance. Uh, you uh, change the value of this uh, record in all dimensions, in all attributes, and measure the the, the result, right? Now you put this, you input this uh, uh, data to the model and see the, the the result. And what with this result, you create a new data set, right? With the perturbations and the expected or the, the predictions in one side. And you pass this data set to a linear uh, algorithm, for example, a linear regression or a, a logistic regression, so that these models are interpretable, like are very simple linear models. You can know which uh, part, um, how to interpret them, and they um, represent the locality of the, the, the record that you are uh, looking. So, uh, for example, uh, using this uh, figure, we can explain better. If we have this point right here, and we can we perturb this point to make new other points uh, near to this point, uh, we can see that in this case it predicts red, right, red, red, red for all of these, but for this it predicts blue, right? So the boundary is here, and then you apply this to a linear model, and they give you this. Uh, line, right? That you can uh, so uh, know these uh, coefficients, for example, which is here, and the coefficients set uh, which attributes are important for the explanation. For example, in this case, moving in this axis uh, change the prediction because if we win with a small um, jump in this direction, we change completely the prediction, while in this direction, it is not so important, because if we go from here to here, uh, we are still in the red uh, class. So this is um, the local explanation, but as I said, it, this is valid for this record, right? If we uh, 
try this same methodology to another record, for example, in this region, the dependency is uh, the opposite, right? We have this direction that variates less than this. So this is the problem with local interpretability that we cannot generalize the, the results. Uh, but what is important about this method is that we can um, use it with unstructured data, yes? So we can apply the same methodology uh, to images and for example, uh, blocks, some parts, some regions of the image and uh, check if the prediction changes, right? For example, if this is a object classification, object detection network, and this is obviously a fraud, Right? But if we uh, hide these regions, will the uh, model also break the probe? That is the question. So we can know exactly what are the key uh, regions, the critical regions that explain the break. And we can do the same with text. If you have text, free text, uh, you can uh, delete some words or erase them or, or hide them. Uh, and ask the model, for example, if this is a, a, a network that it says this, this uh, review is good or bad for the product. For example, if we um, delete some words, we check if the output is the same as before or not. Um, this, for example, in the case of images, gives you the, what I said before, the key critical regions of the image. So for predicting a frog, we see this part. When we only give the model this image, it predicts a pool table, for example. <laughs> and when we give the model this other region, it predicts a nerve balloon. So we can see exactly uh, what are the main regions of these models. But this is local, again. <laughs> this applies only to this photo, but um, we can uh, see other um, models. Yeah, so uh, the next one is, like I said before, uh, using actual people, <laughs> experts, to evaluate these models, right? Uh, after all, the definition of interpretability has you human in, the, uh, in there. So uh, there are two main lines, for example, to, to evaluate this with, with uh, experts. One is a literature review doesn't require experts directly. You only need to uh, look for article papers that support the same rules that your model, your interpretable results give. So if your interpretable results say something and you find a, a paper that says the same, you can use this paper to, to support your, uh, your result. And the last one is uh, if you have access to, to experts, you can uh, ask them present this result and ask them if they, they think that this makes sense or not, right? You can do this in a focus group, in a survey, and there are many strategies to do that, right? So uh, finally, we will see an application of the things that we uh, present here to the stroke risk prediction uh, problem. So as Nelson said in the beginning of this talk, we, this is a problem that we addressed uh, like five years ago. Um, and the idea is to predict if a patient will have a stroke in the next year, in the next three years, or in the next five years. Because a stroke is one of the main death causes in Japan and in worldwide. And we're interested in, in detecting this early, as early as possible, right? Uh, so this is a binary classification problem between stroke and non-stroke classes. And the data that we use is a patient demographic, like age, gender, body mass index, or things like that. We have the history of diseases. Let's say we have all the diseases that a patient has. Uh, and we have exam results, like blood results, uh, urine tests, things like that. So we apply uh, our model, the Dempster Sheffer gradient descent, to this a scenario, and one of the things that the model uh, output are these tables, the, the rule tables. We will see this in detail uh, tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, for this, only uh, you only need to know that this is one of the output of the, of the model. 
So the model gives you these uh, rules that explain uh, the prediction for each class. So for the class stroke, for example, well, what the, this uh, said is that if the patient has a historical disease of cerebrovascular disease, uh, then it is very likely to have an stroke. This is the top rule, right? We have another rule, for example, if the patient has diabetes, the, they increase the risk of a stroke and so on. And we have the same for the class uh, no stroke. Yeah? So the model output this rule. And we can uh, apply what we see early. For example, comparing to a decision tree, we will be using the second methodology to compare rule by rule. Uh, we can compare the results to line. Yeah, uh, we can see partial dependency plot, and also uh, with experts uh, checking the medical literature and, and a survey. So if we apply the same uh, problem, the same task, with the same data set to a decision tree, this is the decision tree that it predicts, right? And um, the second um, metric is rule equivalence, right? Uh, so if we have our rules from the model from the slide before, uh, we can compare if this rule applies, uh, is equivalent to one of the rules in, in the other model. So we can see that the first rule uh, is the same as the root of the node. So this is a match, and this is good for, for the interpretability, right? And then if we descend in the tree, for example, the third rule appears here, and yeah, and the second rule doesn't uh, appear in the tree. But we have, like, uh, for the first and third rule, a match, which is uh, good, right? Generally, we don't have so many matches in between uh, decision tree to other models. So have one is good, having two is better. <laughs> but um, this is uh, the first uh, evaluation, right? The second one is using line, as I said before. We can uh, present one instance. Here we have two different instances of patient that has a stroke, and we can see the local boundary, which are the coefficients of the variables, and we can also make this kind of rule equivalence uh, among these ones. So we have the, the first one repeats there and there, so they, this tells us that basically this is one of the most important rules, yeah? The second one appears also in both. Um, you can do the, 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 the match. There is, for example, the diabetes appears here and here. Uh, but not, not all of them matches, and that is okay. This is expected because they are very different models after all. Uh, we can do the same for the other class, right? We have a stroke and no stroke. Uh, and with no stroke, we uh, find fewer matches because here we have very different patients in, in real world um, rather than the group of patients that have stroke that has very specific uh, characteristics. Yeah, so here we don't find so much uh, matches, but, uh, but this is okay. Yeah, so the next one is partial dependency plot. Uh, like I said before, we can uh, take one attribute and uh, force all the records to, to, to follow these uh, values, and we can see the contribution. So, for example, this tells us that uh, the higher the body fat a patient has, the higher the rate, which is uh, one of the rules that we have also before. Um, for example, for platelets counts, uh, we have an um, uh, a break point here, right? Where if you have less than this value, the risk is higher, and if you have uh, more, uh, it's uh, less risk, and then you can uh, see other interpretable results from, from these charts, right? And uh, moving to the expert side of interpretability evaluation, we can um, compare with medical literature. So for, e, for all of these rules, we can check the literature, check papers, check articles, if they have something to, to say about that. So for the first one, which is having a, a cerebrovascular disease in the past, 
we have a, a strong evidence of that. Uh, here are three articles that uh, all of them said that the risk is increased by uh, 25%, for example, five times in other cases. So this is very well known in the medical field. And uh, the model also uh, extracts this from the data without knowing anything about medicine, obviously. So this is uh, an interesting result. Uh, for example, another one, just for, for showing to you the diabetes, we all also have some articles that state that uh, the stroke risk is twice in patients that has diabetes uh, than the other, right? And this is uh, like medical studies that take patients, uh, use all the biomedical analysis to reduce the, the randomness. So these, they are probably very, uh, correct, right? But we also did an expert survey to actual physicians uh, and neurologists, and we asked them if they agree, disagree uh, with the rule that we are presenting. So we uh, take the rule, uh, we rewrite it in a more <laughs> comprehensive way. Uh, this is in Spanish, by the way. Uh, um, we asked them if they consider that this is true, false, or uh, it may not apply. Yeah? And we did this for the first most important rules, and this is the, the result. We can see that, for example, for the first rule, all the uh, experts agree that this is uh, actually true, so that's okay. Um, for the other three rules, there are some differences, but in, the, in general, they, they agree, right? In the last the column, you have the, the validation rate. Um, but there are other rules, that the ones listed here, that the experts think that, uh, that are incorrect, right? That the validation is less than 50%. That means that they think that the opposite uh, should be true. Um, this is one of the most interesting uh, aspect features of the model, I think, because it um, you can check in the with the data that this is true, right? And this like challenge the knowledge of these experts, uh, or at least they may wonder if this statement is really true, right? Many many in in medical field many things are. Uh, derived from, from experience that if uh, something before said that this is true, then I consider that this is true. But they, they usually or in some cases don't follow a, like a super scientific uh, way to, to prove this uh, to prove this statement. So um, this is interesting and at least it opens research lines for, for them, right? We can do an Another study to see if this uh, attribute is true or not, yeah? And the model gives that also, and this is quite valuable in my opinion, yes? So to end this presentation, uh, we have reviewed that uh, evaluating interpretability is not easy, like in performance, you have to consider very many different aspects. Uh, you have to, uh, forms of all like this, one are automatic based on comparing with other models or are with experts that are the real users of these models. Um, doing interpretability analysis also can help you to, to generate better models, right? You can understand better what a model is doing rather than just putting the data in and having results. Uh, you can understand what is happening. Right, and uh, this is good for, for any task, I think. And uh, the last thing uh, that is important to highlight is uh, it is not necessary to all of the rules of the model uh, should be explained, but one of the, the techniques that we see before, right? We can have um, attributes or rules that are new for the, uh, for the study or particular for this case, and this is okay, right? Unlike um, performance, we 
don't uh, aim to achieve a hundred percent, just a higher value, but not perfect, right? So this was my presentation. Thank you for your time for you. Um, I think we have time for questions. <laughs> Yeah, the, um, the best way is to perform another study to prove exactly this statement. So you have, for example, uh, that the high uh, density cholesterol is good um, instead of bad. So you can uh, have patients and uh, separate them in groups, like um, performing a, a new study to prove if this is true or false. Right. This is like the the, mo the, be the best way to to know exactly if this is true or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, partial dependence plot. Ah, uh, no. This is uh, if this is uh, regression. This is your target. Yeah, and if this is. Uh, Classification, this is the probability to belong to one group, to the positive class, for example. Yes. Now, the probability of having a stroke, for example, of belonging to the stroke class uh, is increased. Yes. Ah, yeah, okay. Uh, let me go this way. Yeah, so uh, in decision trees, you have nodes, right? And the nodes uh, split your data into two groups, the ones that follows the rule and the ones that doesn't follow the first rule. If your model produces interpretability, right? Uh, you can uh, check the interpretability before the split, right? For example, if before the split, this is was the, the explanation of the model, and you can check it after the split uh, for each of these subsets. And the idea of subset differentiation is that these subsets uh, should be very different from the original, because your split in the, in the node uh, is strong. Um, so you can measure how different these uh, interpretable results are uh, with respect to the first one, and you have uh, a metric of similarity to the decision trees. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of remove one feature, but it's like in doing in a more intelligent way, in a smart way, because you have the support of the decision tree in the beginning. Yes. Yeah. Mm. You have different uh, degrees of matches. Uh, you have the full match that is that they are exactly the same. Uh, but you can have partial matches, like the, for example, the same attribute but different ranges. And you can, uh, for example, compute the overlap between these two uh, rules. And then you have a measure of this um, uh, similarity. Yes. An easy way to do that is the, the split strategy. Uh, if you apply the rule to all the whole data set, you see 
how many records, for example, you have in this and this, and then you can measure the uh, if they are uh, equal or similar or or something like that. Yeah, you can apply the rule for checking there. Yeah, that is like intrinsic in the model. For example, in for the uh, artificial neural networks, you cannot derive, derive the rules directly from the, there are techniques, but they uh, usually uh, don't work so well. So uh, it, this is like a precondition to apply this, um, these metrics. Your model have, uh, have to have the ability to produce rules. Yeah, I never heard of that strategy, but <laughs> it could work. I, at least it's interesting to try. Um, yeah, there are other models, like I said, that you can input any models and it can output rules automatically and do very similar thing that what you are saying. But um, but I think this uh, it touches the the state of the art, and so this is new for. Uh, all of these techniques are very new. They have like five years at most. 